Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's Finding a Needle in a Haystack, Enterprise Wide FOIA Searches at CDC webinar. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participants and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Please note all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed at the Q&A sessions of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and sent. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Alina Sima, Director, Office of Government Information Services. Alina, please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alina Simo, and as the Director of the Office of Government Information Services at the National Archives and Records Administration, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our event today titled Finding a Needle in a Haystack, Enterprise-Wide FOIA Searches at the CDC. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Shortly, I will go through some basic housekeeping rules and set some expectations for today's meeting. First, I would like to give you some background on today's event and how OGIS became involved. As many of you know, OGIS is the Federal FOIA Ombudsman, and in that role, we work to improve the FOIA process in a number of different ways, by reviewing agency compliance, by offering dispute resolution services to assist requesters and agencies, by chairing and managing bodies like the FOIA Advisory Committee and co-chairing the Chief FOIA Officers Council and more. In that role, OGIS has a unique perspective on FOIA programs across the federal government landscape. For the last 14 months, we have been watching with interest the impact of the pandemic on agencies' FOIA programs. Just over a year ago, OGIS was pleased to host our first CDC-led webinar, FOIA Requests for CDC COVID-19 Records. Once again this year, the CDC FOIA program managers sought our assistance to speak directly to all of you about how the CDC conducts enterprise-wide searches in response to FOIA requests. You will be hearing today from Srinath Tutukori, who is the IT Project Manager for the CDC FOIA program. Srinath is joined by the CDC FOIA Director, Roger Amdo, and the CDC Deputy FOIA Director, Bruno Viana. The PowerPoint for today's presentation is accessible on the OGIS website at archives.gov forward slash OGIS. We will also add it to the chat. Throughout this morning, we will be monitoring the chat function on WebEx. We are also simultaneously live streaming on the NARA YouTube channel and also monitoring the chat submitted on that platform. We will be taking questions throughout the presentation. So as you think of questions, please type them using the chat function on either platform. Our plan is to pause periodically to check in and see if there are any questions that have come in via chat. And we will also open up our telephone lines on WebEx during those pauses to give attendees the opportunity to ask any questions orally. An important reminder with regard to your questions. Please be aware that this is not the right time to ask questions without a specific FOIA request. We're happy to have all points of view shared, but please respect your fellow attendees and keep the conversation civil and on topic. We will do our best to answer all of your chat and telephone questions. If we do not get to your question, please don't worry. We will post any unanswered questions and answers on the OGIS website in the upcoming days. We are recording today's session, and we will post a video and transcript of this event on the OGIS website as soon as it becomes available. I also want to take this opportunity to speak to those of you joining us from other federal agency FOIA programs. The CDC's FOIA program has been proactive in communicating with their stakeholders using this venue. OGIS is happy to help any other agency FOIA program to host similar events. If you are interested, please send us a chat during today's event, 
Call us at 202-741-5470 or email us at ogis at nara.gov. We look forward to hearing from you. At this time, I would like to welcome our main presenter today, Srinath Tutukuri, who was also joined, as I mentioned earlier, by CDC's FOIA Director Roger Ando and CDC's FOIA Deputy Director Bruno Diana. Srinath is the IT Project Manager in the CDC's FOIA office. He primarily takes care of managing the enterprise searches, in addition to also being responsible for FOIA's IT infrastructure at the CDC. He has been in this role for more than six months, during which he has explored various tools and options to improve enterprise searches. During this presentation, he will present first-hand information on enterprise search process, the tools being used, potential issues, and finally, tips to scope search requests for optimal results. Srinath, over to you now. Thank you, Alina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Srinath Chidikuri, IT Project Manager here at the CDC FOIA office. Today, I will be giving a presentation related to how we perform enterprise searches at the CDC FOIA office in addition to the issues that we run at the FOIA office when we try to run these searches. And finally, some tips and recommendations that we feel can help us get better search results and even probably take some advice and inputs from the user community and come up with better search results which will help everyone in the long run. Having said that, uh, I would like to go to the next slide which is the agenda of this meeting. Before I get started with the agenda of this meeting, let me go over two important points that I need to tell. The first is, what are the capabilities that we have at the CDC's FOIA office? The capabilities that we have are, number one is, we have access to search on all the email addresses within CDC's domain, so that comes to around five to 10,000 email boxes. In addition to this capability, we also have another capability where we can search for documents on all the shared drives within the CDC's network. Having said that, we do have some limitations on this. The first limitation is that we cannot run a wildcard search on any of the mailboxes, and we also definitely need to take some mandatory approvals from the custodians of these mailboxes in order for us to be able to perform any searches. And second is the same with any of these uh, shared drives too. We need to take the approvals and be granted access on the shared drives before we can search for any documents and locate any documents if there are any. Uh, hopefully this gives you an understanding that we do have limitations when we run the search processes and we cannot just simply run a search on all the mailboxes at CDC and we have limitations where we have to only run searches on a restricted mailboxes and a group of mailboxes. We also cannot run searches on a whole division or a CIO if there are hundreds of people. Uh, hopefully this uh, gives a clear understanding before we can delve deeper into how the agenda of this meeting actually. So the agenda of this meeting is being divided into four categories. The first category is an overview of ES, which is known as enterprise search. The second category is how we categorize this request based on the technical complexities. And the third is the issues that we run into when we perform these enterprise searches. And the last is what are the uh, improvements that we would suggest based on the observations that we have seen when we perform these enterprise searches. And finally, we'll also have a Q&A session over this particular aspect. Before I move to the next slide, uh, does anyone have any questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question via phone, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Once again, pressing pound two will enter you into the question queue, or you may enter your question into the chat box. So right now we have no questions on chat, um, so go ahead. Thank you, Elena. Let me go to the next. Let and me go to the next slide. Yeah. So the first category, which talks about the enterprise search overview, is split into three categories. The first category talks about the process flow. 
The second category talks about the tools that we use, and the third category is one of the most important features that we use to really find you know, search users, which is known as dedupe and containment. Uh, any questions on this uh, three slides so far? Once again, pressing pound two will enter you into the question queue. Yeah. I don't see any questions on the line. Um, and the questions in the chat. Sure. sure. Let me go to the next slide. The yes process flow. So this slide pretty much goes gives an bird's eye view or an uh, complete understanding of how the enterprise search process is performed at the FOIA office here. So even before we get an enterprise search into the technical team, uh, the enterprise search is pretty much uh, analyzed and vetted by the FOIA analyst to make sure that relevant information is present. The most key information that we need to perform an enterprise search is, one, the custodian email uh, mailboxes, and the second is the time span. Without these two, uh, these two pieces of information, we cannot proceed with any enterprise searches. Just in case the requester has not provided us the custodian email mailboxes, our uh, FOIA analysts contact the relevant subject matter experts and get us the relevant custodian uh, details for us to perform this search. The same goes with the time span too. If there is no time span, the subject matter experts provide us the time span information too. So once this uh, information is provided to us, we take, uh, we analyze the search request to see if it needs any keywords. Sometimes the keywords are also provided by the requester. Sometimes if there are no keywords, they come in from our subject matter experts. Or if there are no keywords given, I or the, one of my team members goes through the request and gathers and understands the search request and comes up with the keywords to perform a search. Any questions so far on how this, uh, the analyzed search aspect of the enterprise search? I do not see any questions on the line. And no questions in chat. Sure, thank you. Let me go to the next step in the enterprise search process. So once we have the keywords, the custodian mailboxes, and the time span defined, we take this information and plug it into our primary search tool, which is the Microsoft Office 365 compliance. I will be going over the, uh, how this tool, the capabilities of this tool in, an, in the future slides. But for now, we simply take this details or enter this information as filters into this uh, and put it into the Office 365 compliance tool, which is a graphical user interface, which pretty much hooks into the Microsoft Exchange server and brings us out all the emails which from the Exchange server. Once this information is available to us, we have some next steps that we follow. But before I go to the next step, does anyone have any questions related to this aspect on Office 365 search so far? No questions in chat. And there are no questions on the phone. Sure, thank you. Generally, the next step that we follow is we try to eliminate clutter. However, we do not uh, eliminate any clutter because if the requester has specifically stated that they're not interested in the subscriptions or newsletters, we hold back and we simply perform the search. But if the requester has explicitly given us instructions that they're not interested in any subscriptions or newsletters, we try to eliminate the details too. Uh, I do see one question uh, regarding what is NUIX here. So NUIX is an uh, forensic software which is used for analyzing the data, which I'll be going over in the next section, specifically where I'll be talking about different tools, actually. So once we perform the search and we get the necessary search results, we do and if we have to eliminate any clutter, we go ahead and eliminate any subscription-based emails based on the records that we see, and then we do rerun the search. After rerunning the search, I do, or one of our analysts goes ahead and samples the data to make sure that the results meet the expectations of 
are, are within the scope of the request. So we do capture some uh, metrics regarding how much, what kind of records have been captured for each keyword or how many records are coming from a single mailbox or different custodians and so forth. So we have all this information which is captured. And if the records look very, if the records are very less and uh, we are certain that uh, the search request is a simple request and there's not much of uh, ambiguity in the re results that we see, we go ahead and uh, with the next steps of exporting the data and preparing the data and finally even presenting the data. However, if we see that the results look ambiguous and we have a lot of data, I present it to the analyst uh, with all the necessary insights for them to make or probably contact the requester and make an informed decision and uh, if they are willing to narrow down the scope if required to come down with lesser number of records. And then we probably rerun the search to get some better results. However, if uh, as and when we feel that the records are good enough, we go ahead and export this data into either a PDF and a doc format or a message or an email and sometimes even to a uh, PST record. Uh, we occasionally even, uh, uh, since the graphical user interface has some issues with where we can't really delve much deeper into each record to understand and see if the records are that good, we sometimes take this data and put it in Outlook and uh, get, to get a better insight and awareness of how the data looks. Once we feel that the data is good enough, we go ahead and prepare this data. So this preparation of the data is where we talk about dedupe and containment. I have a specific section to talk about dedupe and containment in detail, but in a nutshell, what the dedupe and containment does is that it eliminates lots of duplicate data and it uh, cuts down the volume of uh, the results by around 20 to 30, 30 20 to 40% based on what we have seen so far. But it helps us to uh, uh, make the records more concise, that way it saves us the time as well as the requesters the time when we are not presenting them duplicate information. And the last step is that we do present this data and we take this data and put it into the file shape and also into our uh, case management tool which is known as uh, FOIA Express which we use and uh, from here on we just pa I pass on the button back to the analyst and the analyst takes it over from here till he brings this case to a logical conclusion and finally closing out the case. And that is the overview, this is an overview of natural of how the whole enterprise search process is performed from a technical perspective at the CDC's FOIA office. So does anyone have any questions regarding the process flow here? Yes, no new questions in the chat so far? Yes, I do see uh, one I do see question. one, yeah. Yeah, sure enough, go ahead. I was going to say, you see the same question I do, right? Yes. Yes, I do see one question where, have you ever had any email fail to properly import into FOIA Express? Uh, yes, sometimes, very rarely do we see, we run into issues where some of those emails fail to load into FOIA Express. In that instance, what we do is that we take the email message out and we try to reformat it into PDF manually. But yes, we do run into occasions once in a while, but it is not very prevalent. So welcome. Any additional questions? Um, that individual clarified uh, more specifically, they come in as their native format rather than the proper format. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the format that they're going to come into. Yeah, so usually we come in, and the, most of the emails come in the proper format itself. We don't get any uh, format which are not non-English specific or not non-ASCII specific, so we never really ran into some of these issues. However, one issue we do run occasionally is that uh, when emails are encrypted, it prevents those emails from being uh, converted into PDF documents. So what we do is that we have to sometimes take those encrypted emails and probably even uh, figure out a way of either going back to the requester to get that email for us and de-encrypt that email and probably put it back into FOIA Express in a different format and resolve the issue. So hopefully that answers the question. All right, and there are no questions on the phone. 
Yeah, I do see another question. Can you repeat the prepared data process? Yeah, sure, definitely. So what we do in the prepared data process is that once we have all the data uh, exported from Office 365, which is usually either in uh, individual messages or it's an .psd file, which it's an, uh, think of it as a zip file with all those different messages, we take this data and put it into a software which we use, which is called the case management software of Fire Express. And we run this data into that software, which is known as DDoS and containment. When we do the DDoS and containment, what really happens is that uh, all duplicate messages are eliminated. So to give you an example is that, let's say I'm running and search on five custodian email boxes, and I had sent this an email to five people, and five of them are the CC. During the DDoS process, what happens is that uh, it only picks one email, one unique email, rather than the five emails. That way it saves us four records which are eliminated from the uh, total, total set. And when I talk about containment, what it really means is that, let's say there is a conversation between uh, myself and another user, and we have 15 different emails going back and forth. The, what the containment process really does is that it eliminates all the individual emails and gets the last email of the email chain. So what really happens is that it saves us from having to go through each individual email and it eliminates the emails which are contained within the final email. So typically what we have observed, as I said in the past, is that the DG pen containment process uh, reduces uh, the record volumes by 20 to 40% while making sure that the scope of the search results is still intact. Hopefully this answers uh, your question, Edwin. Yes, for DDoS and containment, we can use different software. We use Office 365, sometimes does some DDoS process. Uh, Nukes can do DDoS, and uh, Outlook can also do sometimes. We, can, we are capable of eliminating some records, but we primarily use uh, the uh, OFIA Express for containment, actually. So to answer your question, yes, all the records, we definitely go through the FOIA Express software for the containment, and it's extensively used. But every, for every search goes through the containment. As long as we only get, oh, the exceptions would be that we have five or 10 records, and there's no necessity to really do the containment process. L let me go to the next slide. And uh, I did go over some of the tools that we spoke about during the previous process, uh, previous slide, but I can go over each of the different tools that we use here at the FOIA office uh, to make sure that we are able to get the best results out. So any search that, uh, that is performed at the FOIA office primarily first goes through the Microsoft 365 compliance tool. So uh, the way it runs is that, as I said, this tool has is a graphical user interface, which is a web-based interface, which has filters to perform searches. The different filter options that we have are, it gives us an ability to search on keywords, then uh, the subject of the email, the recipients of this email, the participants of an email, as well as uh, who the sender is, and the most important aspect is uh, running the search on the custodians of this email, and finally, a date range. Without the custodians and date range, we do not do any search because it's going to be a wild goose chase and we, the search can take forever and we're not going to get any productive results actually. As I said, the tool is very simple and it gives us insight. It's the first step for us to really get all the data and uh, based on our observation, if the scope is well defined and the record count is less, we do get uh, our records are much more precise, and we are and we feel if we are confident at this level, we just go ahead and move and keep running the search in our uh, the records in any other tools. However, if we do get lots of data and we feel that uh, the search does not look that great or the results can be ambiguous at times, and if the record count is less than like hundred or fifty records, we simply take the records, all this data in a PSD file and quickly analyze it in Outlook. 
And uh, that is then a very quick way of looking at the records for us to analyze if uh, the data looks good or probably may eliminate any records which are not needed. Uh, and uh, usually we stick to, we, we seldom go to the outlook process, but if required, we do it if the record volumes are less. And the next step is that we do not really go into FOIA access to do any searches. And we, what we do is we have been using this uh, forensic software called Nuix. And uh, this software has uh, higher capabilities than uh, the Office 365 software as well as Outlook. And uh, it uh, can really provide much more insights into the records. And it is capable of doing some containment and additional dedupe, which the Office 365 process fails when the record volumes are much more higher. And it gives us an insight into the data and helps us understand if uh, the record clip counts. So what we see is that once we have like a big set of records of around uh, 10,000 records and we run this through Nuix, it cuts down the data volumes and it's much more precise. And uh, it gives us a lot of options to give insights like it groups uh, the data based on subsets, uh, groupings based on topics, and um, it also gives us uh, uh, different domains and how many emails are coming in from each domain. Then uh, it also gives us uh, uh, it also gives us a better ability to like cut down. Let's say the user feels that I'm only interested in all the emails sent from CDC. It it helps us to narrow down this record. So it has different additional search filter options which are not available in Office 365. And we do use this uh, tool on an as needed basis. But it is definitely a powerful forensic software where we can uh, run pretty much uh, data. We can pretty much run and analyze a lot of data, not just Outlook emails, but also even a lot of hard drive based data and a lot of documents and so forth. Any questions on this so far, on the tools specifically? I do not see any questions in the phone queue. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to get into the phone queue, um, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad will enter you into that queue. I see no new questions from the chat. Yeah, thank you. I can uh, move to the next slide. So this uh, pretty much concludes, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, let me talk about this uh, dedupe and containment. I do I did speak about it a few minutes back, but I can present a slide which I've captured from uh, the FOIA Express software, which gives us an insights into how the dedupe went actually. So in this instance, we had around 900 records which were uh, captured after running the search through Office 365 as well as uh, the new software. Uh, we still were, uh, we knew that this 903 records could be condensed further, and as I said, the DDU process typically brings down the records by around 30%. So when we did run this uh, 903 records through the DDU process in uh, FOIA Express, what we found was that uh, our interest is primarily on the green slide, green bar here. We want to see how many records it comes down to. So from 903 records, the records were condensed to 630 records here. And the next thing is that it also uh, gives us the number of records which were eliminated as part of the containment process. So in this instance, 273 records were eliminated as part of the containment process. It, it was not able to eliminate any duplicates. The reason is because all these duplicates were already eliminated by Office 365 as well as NUIX. So we were able to condense the record volumes for 903 to 630, which translates to a reduction of around 30 to 35 percent of uh, records. Uh, just to give you an overview, each record on an average translates to around four pages. So in a perspective, 600 records roughly goes to around uh, 2,500 pages of uh, data, which needs to be analyzed by the analyst again and uh, presented to the final requester. So the, the containment process helps us in uh, greatly actually in uh, reducing this volume of records while keeping the scope intact and saves time for the analyst as well as for the end requester. Any questions on this, on the DDP and containment? There are no questions on the phone line. No chat question, Patter, thank you. Thank you. I can move to the next slide. Yeah. 
So that pretty much concludes the first section of uh, the overview or the bird's eye view of the enterprise search process at uh, CDC. So the different aspects that I did cover were the process flow, then the different tools that we use, and also the DDU process. Let me move to the next section, which is how uh, the technical team categorizes the enterprise search process. I would like to make it clear that uh, we also have another categorization on the administrative aspect of enterprise searches, so I'm not be, I will not be going into that aspect. Here the categorization is primarily limited to the complexity that is involved uh, from a technical aspect when we try to get search results. So the first, I have categorized this search into three different categories. One is the low intensity, the next is the moderate intensity, and the last is in high intensity search. Uh, I would like to go to the next slide where I'll be talking about low intensity search. So when I say low intensity search, uh, what it really means is that uh, the search is a very simple to perform and we are absolutely certain that we are getting the right results and we can very quickly get the search done and close out the request in a timely fashion without any issues or without having to go back and forth with the requester. So, and as a side, uh, the picture here depicts, keep it simple. So generally when the requesters try to keep it simple, uh, we know that the search is a very low intensity search. So what is really a low intensity search? Uh, I have uh, placed a few attributes which primarily define what a low intensity search is for us. So we have the custodian mailboxes which are defined. So when I say custodian mailboxes are defined, we know that the request, we have to run a search on a few of, uh, uh, a few custodian mailboxes, it could be a director or a vice or an assistant director or probably the head of and division and things like that. So it's very clear on who we are running the search. The next is that we also have a very short time span. It's a very important thing with the time span actually because the shorter the time span, our results are more accurate and uh, more in line and in sync with the scope of the request. So it makes it, so if it's a two week search or a three week search or a few days around an event, the search results are very precise. And the next is the number of participants. So if we know who the participants are, let's say we have a very limited participants, like a discussion between a few individuals, four individuals, five individuals, then it really helps us to narrow down the search results that makes the search results more accurate actually. And the last is uh, not having any un unambiguous keywords. When you say unambiguous keywords, uh, we don't uh, expect a keyword like run a search on COVID or run a search on uh, autism or run a search on AIDS or SARS. So it could, the searches could be very vague and we could get tons of records actually. That's what I mean by unambiguous keywords. Any questions on this so far? We have one question on the chat. Do you use NUIX as your primary method to deduce your records and or do you think this is a more efficient way to deduce compared to the ADR slash EDR tools within FOIA Express? We do not use DDU to primary, uh, we do not use NUIX to primarily dedupe the records. So we do use DDU, uh, NUIX for deduping, but the first step of dedupe always happens at Office 365. And if anything is missed out during the DDU process at Office 365, it is captured in NUIX. And by and large, NUIX does a good job with DDU, so we do not see any DDU happening when we do the uh, containment and DDU process in uh, FOIA Express, actually. But FOIA Express does an excellent job with the containment process. And probably NUIX also has an ability to do the containment process, but we haven't figured that out. As I said, we only started using it in the last three to four months. Does that answer you, your all. question? Okay. Sure. If there are no questions related to the low intensity search, I can show an example of what a low intensity search is so that it gives an understanding of what I really mean by low-intensity search. The next slide, please. Uh, here is an example of a low-intensity search, and I'll do like 15 seconds for you to go ahead and read the content of the low-intensity search. Yeah. 
All right. So the requester here has requested for all email communication between the CBC's director and the office of the vice president, Mike Pence, between September 10th and October 1st. So the time span here is very short, 20 days. We know who is the custodian here. It is the director of the CDC. And we also know who are the participants here. So the participants are uh, two people. One is the director of CDC. And it could also be anybody from the office of the vice president. It could be a secretary or anybody sending those emails to us. So we have our mailbox defined. We have our date defined. And there is no necessity to do a uh, keyword search here. And all we do is that we make sure that the participants uh, are anyone from the domain of uh, the email domain of the vice president. So in this instance, all the participants would be our, uh, it would have a domain address of ovp.evop.gov. So that would be an uh, partial uh, content or, or, or a suffix within the email address of uh, any email coming in from the office of the vice president. So that pretty much will give us a very concise result, accurate result, and uh, from here we can just take those results and uh, we straight go to the, take those results and if the record count is very small, we just take those records and we run them through the dedupe and containment process within uh, FOIA Express and we're able to get the results out in a very short time span and uh, the analyst is able to close out the results. So what I mean to say is that it's a very simple search for us because the scope is very clear and there is no ambiguity and it makes it very easy on us to get searches done. So uh, if our requester communities can uh, provide us searches which are very specific and very low intensity, it helps us in the long run. Any questions on this uh, example? I do not see any questions in the phone queue. Nothing on the chat. Thank you. Thank you. I can move to the next slide. So, uh, so when I talk about uh, the next slide is about moderate intensity search. So when I say a moderate intensity search, what I really mean is that uh, sometimes the custodian mailboxes can be defined or may not be defined, but we have a way of figuring out who the custodians here are. And uh, the participants may be known sometimes or they may not be known, but uh, typically in a medium intensity search, we could have more number of participants too. And we may also have to run uh, searches on uh, group mailboxes like event-based inboxes or response-based email boxes and so forth. And uh, the search is not specific to a particular keyword. It could be a phrase search or it could be a combination of keywords that need to be searched on. And generally the date range is uh, larger or it could be in a much longer date range or a time span. So when I say a moderate intensity search, what it really means is that the record count is much more higher. Typically, it is between 100 and 1,000 uh, of records. But uh, we do know that uh, we can definitely get the records here, but it involves some work on our end before we can really pinpoint and nail the accurate results which are relevant for the scope of the request. Any questions on this uh, moderate intensity search? There are no questions on the line. No. Thank you. I will uh, go over an example of a moderate intensity search. Probably I'll take a few more minutes to really explain that example in much more detail. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah. I'll give 15 seconds for you to go ahead and read the, uh, read the content of the search. All right, uh, let me get started with this uh, request. Uh, I, the, there is this request relates to a uh, news reporter who was interested in finding out the investigation that CDC had performed uh, related to an incident where 
a few people were infected with COVID when traveling on a bus uh, from Milwaukee all the way to Texas. And apparently, unfortunately, an individual passed away too. So the event detail, if you look at the email, says it's around October 13th, 2020 when the event happened. So in this instance, we do not have any custodian mailboxes to search on, nor do we have a uh, time frame on where to perform the search. However, the only thing that we, could, we have from this request is we are able to pick up the different keywords. One is COVID-19, then it's a commercial bus. It has reference to a particular um, company, a bus company, El, Tor El Tornado, then uh, and, uh, a place which is Seneca Foods and uh, some of the different stops like Laredo, Chicago, Wisconsin, and so on. So we do have sufficient keywords to probably even start off with a search here. So what happens here is that our analyst goes to the, uh, probably contacts the relevant subject matter experts and uh, was able to identify the people who really performed this investigation. So we do get the custodians from them, and they're also provided as a time frame on when to perform this search. So we had the custodians now, and we also had the time frame. So when we, any questions so far uh, on this? There are no questions on the line. No questions yet, thank you. Sure, thank you. I, uh, please, uh, to the next slide. Yeah. So we did uh, take the keywords the custodian mailboxes and the date range, and we did perform a search on the Office 365 uh, uh, tool on the Exchange server. So the way we did the search was that we had to come up with a uh, concatenated phrase or come up with a set of uh, keywords where we had to use either a Boolean search of and or or probably to draw some uh, results and, and do some analysis on it. So what we really did was that we said, Let's do a search based on bus and any of these keywords, Milwaukee or uh, different places here, San Antonio, Dallas, and so forth, or it's a motor coach and any of the different places here uh, within this particular date range. So based on the search that we ran, we were able to get around, uh, I think it is, I don't remember the exact figure, but it is a few hundreds of records. And I believe we had probably around uh, three or four custodians who did, uh, who, on whose mailboxes we had to perform this search. So we came up with around uh, four or 500 records, and we were quickly able to ascertain that, yes, these uh, records look uh, in sync with what the requester is looking for. We, I usually do, or we do some sampling of a few records here and there to see if the records look relevant and the keywords look relevant. So in this instance, we were able to identify that within the subject of each email, which says COVID-19 bus contact or land conveyance, bus investigation, those things which are highlighted in yellow, show those particular keywords being captured. And we also did see some... Uh, emails which were like newsletters and uh, news articles, reports, and things like that, which were uh, and news articles which were not really relevant to the investigation. So we had to eliminate those, uh, we call them clutter because these are noise emails which are not really relevant to the investigation. So we had to eliminate newsletters as well as subscription emails and things like that. And we were able to cut down some of those results. But still, we had a large number of records, and we did know that Office 365 can sometimes be a little uh, haywire here, where it it's not really accurate. It can it can it is Office 365 generally is not going to be very accurate when we have multiple keywords and we have a combination of phrases and multiple custodians. So that is when we really need to go to the next level. So in this instance, after eliminating most of this uh, noise-based emails, we took this records and we put them into NUIX. And NUIX did a much better job of uh, eliminating some records which really didn't make sense. Because when we were uh, doing phrase-based searches and uh, combination of keywords, it did come up with uh, records which were not relevant. So it cut down some of those records, actually. 
So that is, this is what a moderate intensity search is, and uh, the units also give us a lot of insights as well as topics. Uh, it gave us groupings and topics, but in general, we were confident that the records that were coming out of MUIX and what we were saying was in line with what the requester was looking. But this definitely needed much more effort. It was not a simple search, and we needed to make sure that these records are relevant, and we just went back to the requester again based on the insights that the analyst has provided, and once we got the necessary approvals, we move forward with the due date and containment process, which again reduced around 20 to 30 percent of records. So this is what really a moderate intensity search looks like. So when I say moderate intensity search, it's the characteristics are it has lots of mailboxes. The record volumes run into 100, and we definitely need to run this process through multiple software, and we definitely do some analysis. And it's more than likely that we have to go back and forth with the requester before we can finalize the record. Uh, and any questions? I do see a few questions on the chat. So let me try to go with the first question. So the first question was, are you referring to e-discovery when you're using search tool in Office 365? Is it an e-discovery tool? Are you referring to e-discovery when you're using the search tool in Office 365? Yes, it is the same thing. We do use the e-discovery tool, that's right. Okay, great. And the next one, I'm not sure if you can answer or if this is going to be one for uh, Roger Bruno. Could you speak briefly on how subject matter experts and potential custodians are determined before creating a search query? Thank you. This is Roger. I can, I can take that question. So uh, depending upon what the scope of the request is, um, CDC has set up an emergency operations center uh, to handle the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And they have teams that are set up to address specific <clears throat> Um, uh, to, to, to address specific um, aspects of the pandemic. So you have, for example, folks who deal with the vaccine, other folks who deal with the no-sale order, various groups. So depending upon what the request is about, then if it's COVID-related, uh, we would send the request where we, in a situation where we have no um, custodians provided because the, probably the request doesn't even know who the custodians are. We would send it to the emergency operations center and say, Please give us uh, the names of the folks who will be involved with this topic that this request is, is interested in. And so they would then identify either custodians or a particular uh, mailbox that's being used by a team that would um, reasonably contain the records requested. Does that answer the question? I don't see anything else in the chat, so I think we'll assume yes unless we hear something more. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, there was a follow-up. Um, sure. Just thank you. Um, and for non-COVID topics, is it the same process? Uh, for non-COVID topics, the, the, the same process, but the, 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 the process would be we would identify the program office within CDC that is likely to have responsive records and send it to them and say, We've received this request. Uh, we need uh, you to provide the documents. And if they want us to conduct the search, they would provide the names of the custodians whose email boxes we search against. Thank you. And if, and if for example, if they, if, and sometimes they might come back and say, um, I'll give an example. I'll give an example of where the 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 requester doesn't identify mailboxes, but he identifies a whole group. So a requester comes and says, I want you to search against, search for all em employees within NCRD's emails for this keyword. Well, like Sina said earlier, we can't perform the search against email boxes for just a particular program office, right? So literally you're asking us to search against custodians for an entire program office or division. We're going to come back to you and say you're going to have to limit it. Um, so if you can't limit it by name, you're going to have to limit it by a topic enough that they will identify who are the folks who worked on this particular subject matter. And then they will provide a list of custodians. Thanks, Roger. No other questions? Sure. 
Thank you. And uh, if there are no questions, I can move to the next slide. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a high intensity research here. And uh, if you look at the picture there, the person there is me who is bald and lost his hair because of the type of request I got. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so typically what happens in a uh, high intensity search is that we do not, the biggest characteristic of a high intensity search is that the request, the scope of the request is very vague. And we run into probably thousands of records, sometimes 10,000, sometimes 20, sometimes 30, and I've seen searches going to 80,000 records. So the, why do we see, uh, why do we get such kind of records actually? So if you look at the characteristics here, we don't have a clear custodian mailbox defined sometimes. Sometimes we have too many custodian mailboxes defined. Okay? And the next is sometimes we do not know the participants in this uh, email conversation. So when we do not know the participants, it's possible that there could be a discussion with so many people on this particular topic and uh, it could go to any extent where it becomes very difficult to identify which uh, emails are really relevant uh, to the scope of this request actually. And sometimes we also do not get uh, any keywords, so we have to frame our own keywords and we have to come up with uh, keywords based on the request. And uh, we, get, we and most of the times when the high intensity search starts, it's an uh, unknown unknown for us. But looking at the request, we can say that this is probably a high intensity search because uh, once we run the search through Office 365 and we see all these different uh, volumes of records, then we figure out that yes, this is going to be a uh, wild goose chase where we're not going to get too many records. And what really makes it more complex is sometimes we have requests which uh, where we have to uh, use Boolean searches like OR and AND to concatenate the search results and uh, the records can be very heavy. And, and finally, even having too many attachments in the emails can also complicate. Sometimes we see slides, presentations which have different words which absolutely have no mm -hmm. relation to the scope of the request. So. That is what in high intensity search really I'm talking about here right now. Any questions related to the high intensity search? There are no questions on the phone. This right, I just wanted. No, no, no I just wanted to add one. Th um, at least from my experience with these high intensity searches, um, I think Zuneth was pretty generous when he said that uh, um, uh, a record average size is four pages. Um, a record size could be, um, it posed that it, it could be one email, one page, or it could be as much as five or six pages. So we talk about an email string, and that is just the email string itself without including the attachment. So if it has three or four attachments, and each attachment is on average four pages, you see how that establishes into being a lot of records. Just um, on its face. So sometimes when we say um, we, um, we located 5,000 records, that doesn't translate into pages. It could be 5,000 pages. 5,000 records could be 25,000 pages. It all depends upon what's, um, how many, what the average size of, what the size of the a record is and how many attachments it contains. And what we've had with some requesters is they would say, at least we've agreed with them, is remove the attachments, right? So you just, they just want the raw emails, and then they would come back, we would negotiate and say, you can always come back and ask for a specific number of attachments after the fact. And that could also help with us being able to process your request much more timely if we don't have to process the entire record set, including attachments and everything else. So that's over. Thank you very much, Roger, for reminding me of that uh, issue. I forgot about it. Thank you. Uh, if there are no questions, we can go to the next slide. Okay. I'll pause for 15 seconds so you can read, everyone who can read this request. It is an example of a high intensity search here.
All right. So we had a requester who was interested in all responsive records related to procedures, guidelines, and uh, discussions that happened around coming up with a guidance on wearing face masks to slow down the speed of uh, COVID-19. In this instance, there were no specific keywords given to us, and we had to come up with a set of keywords. The next is that we had to identify who are the uh, custodian mailboxes, as, a, as Roger has already mentioned. We get that information from the SME who give us the guidance on what those custodian mailboxes are. And the next is the date range, which is also coming either from the requester or it's going to be given to us by the SME. So in this instance, the keywords that uh, were identified as face masks, face coverings, respirators, and N95. See, these were the different four keywords that we were given. So when we do a search here, what it necessarily means is that I have to locate records which are either a face mask or masks, face covering or face coverings, respirator or respirators, or even respiratory, anything. So we do prefix searches as well as suffix searches, and finally the N95 mask. So we had to concatenate a string to come up with uh, the keyword searches. So I can... Uh, any questions so far? There are no nope. questions on the line. I can uh, move to the next slide, which talks uh, shows the results of the search results, actually. Based on the search that was performed here, we had come up with 22,877 records. So I'm only talking about unique emails, actually. It's not the number of pages. So if we do, and this was the insights that we got based on the preliminary search that we did in Office 365. Uh, and uh, it, for mass, it came up with 12,000 records. For respirator, it was 12,000. Face and cover was 6,000. So the total records were around 22,000 records here. And uh, just keep in mind that these emails were only emails sent by this four users, which were like uh, high-level officials within CDC. You only had four high-level officials, and we are not even talking about emails which were sent to them. So the volume of records here was very high, just 22,000 records. Uh, and uh, looking at this results, I do know that uh, probably since it is four mailboxes and I do a DDU uh, containment, I could probably come down to eliminate 40% of the records here. And uh, the search analytics I'm providing here is only primarily at the Office 365 level, which probably is around 80% accurate at this point of time because I see so many records. So if, probably if I were to run this record through new weeks after d and content, containment, I would probably come down to less than 10,000 or less than that. I cannot determine the uh, records, but it's, it's going to be less than that. But still, that's a huge number of records. So 10,000 and as, a, as even five pages for each uh, record could translate to 50,000 records. So I don't think it is humanly possible for any of our analysts or even the requester to go through this 50,000 pages of data and uh, digest this information and comprehend this information and come up with some reasonable uh, analysis. So at this point of time, we simply I make a determination letting the analysts know that uh, this is going to be, the scope is too broad. We definitely need to narrow down the request. Or, uh, and these are the insights that I see, and these are the keywords that I see. So if the requester wants to uh, make a determination on how the insights look, I go ahead and share all the information with him. Uh, so the requester goes back to the analyst and tries to narrow down the scope in this instance. Uh, however, in some instances, let's say we come with a few thousand, like 7,000, 8,000 records, and there are like lots of mailboxes, just the custodian mailboxes are 15 or 16, then I do know that there's a potential for a lot of duplicates. So in that instance, uh, we do go through the DDU process and uh, in probably even run through NUIX, and if it's less than 1,000 records, then probably we give it a shot and we try to go through the ultimate steps to prepare the data actually. Uh, 
Any questions on this uh, so far? So I have one technical question. Um, someone asked, if applicable, how do you use NUIX, NUIX in high intensity searches? Sure. So the, the way we use NUIX in high intensity searches is that after the records have been uh, filtered or we get in first set of data from Office 365 search, which is the e-discovery search, we take the whole data as a PST file or even individual emails if it's in thousands. So if it's in the 10,000, we don't take individual emails, we simply take the whole PST file. And we take that uh, data and put it into NUIX. And we run the same search terms that we ran in Office 365. Uh, NUIX does a better job with eliminate, and it, it has a mechanism to eliminate some records which are probably missed in Office 365. It, and it brings down the number of records comes down. That is the first thing. And sometimes it can also eliminate some duplicates. So we definitely see a reduction. It just depends on the number of custodian mailboxes and the number of keywords and so forth. So it's undeterministic to say how much percentage needs can eliminate, uh, which were not eliminated by Office 365. The next step is uh, NEWS has a much more higher analytical capability where it uses uh, analysis based on which uh, mailbox has uh, e a lot of emails being sent or which domains or which organizations are sending all these emails and which email address is sending us emails e which are in the CC, which are in the BCC, which are in the two. It also provides us like uh, um, insights on around which date or which time frame do we see a lot of emails going out. Uh, I'll call them heat map, heat map kind of things, so that, that analysis is also there. And it also separates the records. It gives us subsets of data saying that, okay, if you're trying to do swipe swipe, mask, face, and face mask, for these three keywords, we see around 500 records. But when we, it, it, it has its own way of analyzing groups. So it gives us different subsets of groups, actually. So that, uh, it gives us all the analytics, it provides us sufficient analytical information uh, for the uh, requester as analyst to make an informed decision to narrow down the scope, is all I can tell you. So that is how we primarily use NUIX in high intensity search. Thank you. Um, I have another question, it might be better for Roger or Bruno. Um, someone on YouTube chat asked, um, do they need to request all related attachments if they want attachments. So I, I think that means would you assume attachments unless you hear otherwise, or do people actually have to specifically ask for attachments if that's what they want? Great question. Unless unless you say you don't want attachments, then then your request, the, the search would include attachments. So the default is yes, attachments. The default is okay. yes. Yeah, the default is yes, unless you say no. Great. Um, and then the second question came in, and it has to do with records retention. How, how far back do archives go for files searched? Do they follow records retention schedules and get destroyed on a schedule like paper files ordinarily would be? And do searches recover files that have been deleted by individuals, no longer needed, not required to be retained? Uh, long question. Um, I'm not a <laughs> records retention expert, um, but this is what I'll say, is that we have received, when we receive a request um, for documents, primarily emails, um, which we have, where someone says, I'm looking for all email correspondence from X starting from 2005 or from 2000, if we can search against the customer's email box, we would start from that time frame, from 2000 or 2002. If those records are still with, contained within the mailbox, it's going to be pulled. If it's not there, they won't be able to pull it. So um, can we can we pull data that has been deleted uh, from a person's mailbox? I don't, and I'm not sure it corrects me, I don't believe that the, e -dis the 365 e-discovery tool can do that. Um, if if, if it, the emails are for somebody who is in a capstone program, which is the, the few folks whose emails are basically archived forever, and I'm, I don't mean that literally, but pretty much forever, um, then we can search against any date range. So, for example, um, Redfield's emails are archived, even though he's gone. So, 10 years from now, if someone makes a FOIA request for for, COVID, for Redfield's COVID-related documents, we're going to find it because his mailbox, everything in his mailbox was captured. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, thank and you. I'll just speak for, for NARA and records management. Electronic records are scheduled like paper files generally. So, yes, that is a true, that is a true statement. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Alina, and thank you, Roger. Yes, I just want to add one statement of this is that uh, there is a record retention policy within CDC, and each mailbox is treated differently. So our records um, liaison at the records retention agency within uh, division within CDC, uh, we can give us clear directions on how many months or how many years a particular mailbox can be retained actually. So based on that, we can quickly say, uh, quickly at least let the requester know that this mailbox's mails are not going to be found, or if, as Roger has said, if it's a capstone official, probably the records retention policy is much more la longer actually. And this is Roger again. I just wanted to add something um, just on it, the NUX tool because someone had a question about that. The NUX, NUX what it does that um, the e 365 e discovery tool doesn't do is that it's able to better analyze the data. And so by being able to properly analyze the data, it helps us um, actually find a needle in a haystack. haystack. That is what NUX is supposed to do. So it's it, it, we don't use it to for let's say for uh, deduplication because the EDR feature can do that in three search. It's more to analyze the data. So for example, what Senator was talking about heat maps, where where is most of the email traffic coming from? It categorizes the the, 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 the records. Um, we've had NUX for quite a while, um, but CDC has basically we have definitely increased our usage of e-discovery tools since COVID. And so we, we're still a work in progress, um, and we continue to um, utilize the functionality of the system, but it certainly is a much, much more robust system in, for analyzing data than uh, the e-discovery tool is or ADR is in helping us look at records. Thank you, Roger. Martha, um, we actually Martha you have, have a question on Twitter, right? Correct, we've been monitoring Twitter, and so we do have one question. What does CDC have available or will make available to help requesters better understand who the custodians would be for a particular email? Are there org charts or directories? Uh, they said it seems like CDC is placing the burden on the requester to know this. Well, let me, let me, let me uh, to the extent that we place, um, <laughs> My position is that in some situations, the FOIA requester, in a lot of situations, the FOIA requester may not know who the custodians are, and sometimes they do. And so, to the extent that a FOIA requester doesn't know, would not know who the custodians are, I, I tell my team uh, we should not go back to them and ask them for names of custodians because they wouldn't know. For example, if somebody makes a FOIA request and says, "I want any correspondence sent by the chief of staff for Governor Cuomo," this is the person's name to anybody in CDC, well, they don't have to know who the recipient in CDC is. We've, they've given you the name of the person who sent an email, right? And so then we can go to EOC and say, hey, did anybody have any contact with the chief of staff for Cuomo? So yes, in some circumstances, uh, the EOC, one of the, and I would say problems with the EOC, the EOC is made up of employees who are detailed for a period of time and they leave. So it's a revolving door. So that it's not um, the, the, the people who are in the today may not be there 60 days from now. So it continues changes. Um, so there's not a list of folks who are, who are there for the entire duration of the pandemic. They're not. Um, they go on detail for 30 to 60 days and they go back to their program office. The very few of them stay on um, for much longer periods. So that is part of the, the give and take. And so to the extent, and I'm sure this happened, and, and, and I would own that and apologize for that, but to the extent that we are placing a burden on you to look for custodians, we might be doing a situation where, A, we've identified that you would know who the custodians are because of what you say. And in a, in a situation where you don't know who the custodians are, then if you properly describe the topic matter, then it makes it easier for us to identify the custodians. I mean, for example, if you say, I want all correspondence um, about um, communications between CDC and CBP with regard to some particular topic, right? If the topic is scoped enough, 
we will be able to identify the folks within CDC who had any discussion, but not everyone, but at least the heavy hitters who were involved in the discussion. Um, with regard to whether there's going to be an, an org chart, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not sure an org chart necessarily will be helpful unless you're talking about the, the heads of the units who don't change, but even then, they change. I mean, the emergency, the, the, I think that manager of the EOC um, has not, we've gone through at least three, I think, to date. So they, they change. Um, so I think what is important is be very clear about what it is you're asking for. You don't have to give us clarity on the custodians, but be clear on what it is that you're looking for. And then we can take it from there. And to the extent that even they're not clear who the custodians are, we'll come back to you and ask you to refine your ask so that we can identify who is having a discussion about what you're asking for. Yeah, thank you, Roger. And uh, it was a good reminder of reminding everyone of uh, the title, identifying the needle in the haystack, which you forgot actually. <laughs> yeah, and I do see one question here is, uh, how do we eliminate duplicates? And this has already been covered in the discussion. We can use any of the tools like Office 365 or a new X or even uh, FOIA Express to eliminate uh, duplicates. Uh, however, for containment, we only can use, uh, right now we are, our capabilities are limited to using FOIA Express for containment. Thank you. Any questions on this uh, search so far? I interest research. There are no questions on the line. And that covers the chat for now. Thank you. Yeah. So before I move to the next slide, what I would say is that any high intensity search is born with lots of complexities and uh, a decision has to be made whether we move forward with the request or we hold back and send it back to the request. So that decision is made based on the number of custodians and the type of emails that we see, if the keywords are very generic and so forth. So sometimes there is some discretion when we have to go back to the requester to let them know that we cannot perform this search. Yeah. And uh, I can move to the next slide. So I have covered uh, the different uh, categorizations of the searches based on the technical complexities that we have seen so far. Uh, the next uh, topic or next section is the issues that we see when we perform uh, searches here. So we have made an attempt to identify the problems and help the end users uh, to know the problems that we face to see if we can find some solutions and come up with better search results. So the first uh, issue that was really identified was broad scope, the second was high record count, and the third is average data quality. And the three of these are pretty much uh, related. And uh, I can quickly go to the next slide where I'll be talking about uh, the broad scope of research. I think, I think by now, you would, uh, most of you would have been, uh, are pretty much aware of what the broad scope really means like. The characterizations of the broad scope are too many keywords then uh, having very generic keywords like just say searching on autism or searching on SARS or searching on COVID or having too many mailboxes and the date range is very large. Sometimes we get requests where the date range is for a few years or a few months and uh, the results are uh, very, very, too many results where it becomes really hard for us to identify the search actually. So just to put it in perspective, if you look at the picture there, uh, the scope, uh, it has, uh, it's a rainy day and we have so many umbrellas there, but in reality we only need one umbrella to identify the request here. And in this instance, the yellow umbrella is good enough for us to identify the records and narrow down the scope actually. A any questions related to this uh, topic of broad scope? There are currently no questions online. Nothing new, thank you. Yeah, next slide. Yeah. And uh, as we have already discussed in the high, like high intensity search, we see very high data volumes. And it really becomes very difficult for us to identify which is the right data or which is the wrong data, uh, unless the requester is really specific about what he's looking for. And sometimes some requesters are very good at telling us what they are really looking for. But sometimes some requesters come up with some 
uh, I cannot uh, get into the requester's mind to or probably read his mind to understand what he really is looking for or what she is really looking for. That is what makes it complex. So that, when that, such a situation arises, it so happens that we get so much of data and we I cannot uh, we cannot know which is the real data in this. So just to give you a perspective, if you look at the picture, we have so much of uh, uh, records there and we do not know which is the right data in the picture, right data there. Uh, any questions? There are no questions on the line. No? Yeah. 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 I can move to the next slide. And uh, I think this is a relatively interesting uh, topic here. So I'm using this term called average data quality. So when we do a search based on few keywords, uh, sometimes we do see records being retried. And when we do analyze the records, it turns out that uh, we know that these records are not really what the end user is looking for. But since the requester has not clearly specified that he needs this records or those records, we still have to deliver this record. Uh, I can give you an example of uh, a request where we were asked to search uh, for records on all mailboxes at the CDC's Gautamala office. And when we did then search on Gautamala and ICE, ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, what we found was that we were getting all emails where the word Ga Gautamala was uh, showing up in the email signature and the word ICE was showing up in some uh, attached documents in a PDF or in a Word document. And uh, we absolutely knew that these records were not what the end user was looking for. So this is what it means. So we have the quantity of the data here, but the quality is very poor because we are very certain that we are not getting the right record. Sometimes uh, somebody asks for um, a response for COVID. So when we run a search for response for COVID, we do have a uh, division or an uh, UOC on a specific branch which is looking at COVID response. So people have their, uh, <coughs> excuse me, people have their addresses as COVID-19 response. So what happens is all the emails with signatures of COVID-19 response show up. And I do know that these are not the records that they're looking for, but I still have to deliver them because these records uh, are what the requester requested. So if it makes sense, what I'm trying to say is that the quality of the search is poor uh, because of the keywords that have been provided or because the scope of the request was not really clear, if it makes sense. <coughs> Any questions on this? There are currently no questions in the phone queue. Um, there's one chat question, so it's a bit broader. Uh, we can save it or we can take it now. Which do you prefer? I think it's for you, Roger. Okay, we can, we can, we can take it now. Okay. Um, I've seen the CDC FOIA annual report. You received approximately 2,400 requests last year. How many FTEs do you have dedicated to doing FOIA searches for this number of requests? Um, dedicated to doing FOIA searches is one, sir, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. We're, we're, trying, we're, we're working on getting uh, a contractor to assist us, but right now it's just it's just doing the searches. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I just wanted to add, as far as this average data quality, in a situation where the, the, the keyword that has been provided by a, by a requester is so generic that it's going to be found in, for example, people's signature bot, for example. Um, one way to limit that would be to say the keyword should appear in the email content or in the subject. I mean, that, that would, would narrow it down. I mean, so that we go, okay, if the word should appear in the body of the email or it should be in the subject or it should be, um, I think we can do searches within a certain number of words. So COVID within five or ten words of no sale, no sale order or some other word, um, just so that we make sure that whatever it is that you're looking for, right? Because at the end of the day, the requester, you are seeking information that is useful to you. And to the extent that we are looking and reviewing documents that are of no use to you, that is a waste of our time, that's a waste of your time, that results in a delay of response to you, because at the end of the day, 
you want information that's useful to you. And a lot of times when it comes to e-discovery searches, you as a requester can do a lot to help us in making sure that we have good data to provide to you by the way you scope your request and, and to the extent that you make it um, easier for us to be very much more precise in identifying the documents that are responsive to your request. Over Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Uh, if you don't have any additional questions, we can uh, move to the next section. Yes. Yeah, so, so far, uh, I've done a lot of complaining regarding issues, and uh, we have made done some analysis and uh, based on observations, uh, we are glad that we have found some recommendations that we are willing to share with the end users, and also probably take any inputs or advisors that you have for us so that we can come up with better search results. So hopefully this last section is going to be more uh, intuitive and useful to all of you. So let me start with the first uh, aspect of improved EES search when I say well-defined scope. So what does a uh, well-defined scope really mean? So I'll categorize this into three different uh, sections. So when I say well-defined scope, what I mean is that we do not want any ambiguity in the scope. The requester needs to be very precise and concise in what he's looking for. So as long as the requester is very precise and concise in what he's looking for, I'm very confident that we can get very good results. The second is, if a requester is looking to perform multiple searches within one single search, the recommendation is that he split each search into its individual line item within the search, within the search request. It will even be better if each uh, sub-search is made its own individual request. That way, uh, each search is pretty focused on an objective of what we're looking to achieve. That really helps us out, actually. And the last thing is that one recommendation is that most of the searches that I have observed is that there's a lot of newsletters and subscriptions that come in. And we do see a lot of requesters explicitly stating that we do not need newsletters and subscriptions and we are looking only at conversations and things like that. So that is really appreciated. When we have this uh, three or four items taken care of, when the scope is really well defined, it makes the search much more predictable. It saves us a lot of time. And as Roger has stated, it provides much more productive results and it helps the end requester get the right data. Any questions on this? Um, there are currently no questions on the phone. Thank you. And no new chat questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me go to the next uh, item on this, uh, limiting keywords. So when I say limiting keywords, what I mean is that it's always, sometimes we do get requests where requesters give us keywords and say we want to search on this keyword. We give us one subset of keywords another subset of keywords and say pick an or between this subset and that subset or an and between this and that. So what happens is that when we have multiple keywords coming in, I absolutely know that the search results are very diluted and we are getting a much more generic and abstract uh, subset of data. So it's going to be a needle in and haystack here. That's for sure. Though. So if the requester can be very concise or precise saying that I'm only looking for this keyword or this keyword, that really helps us in narrowing down the searches. And the biggest recommendation I would say is that rather than using an AND or an OR search, the second recommendation is to go with a phrase search. I can quote an example of a phrase search. So we didn't get a request that asking for uh, testing for COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. So that is a very good phrase, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when I search for this phrase, I'm going to get uh, any records or all the records because people can use different words that probably they could rephrase the content of what they're looking to search in different ways. So what we figured out is that uh, testing in COVID, uh, testing for COVID-19 in uh, skilled nursing facilities. So the way uh, the way the search was performed was 
rather than say testing, we say test, test star, so the word is a suffix. So it could be test, testing, or testing. That is one way. And the next is looking for testing within five or ten words uh, to the reference of uh, COVID. Or it could be in, uh, in uh, SARS, uh, in COVID-19, or corona, or things like that. So COVID is within, uh, testing, test or testing is within COVID, or SARS, uh, in COVID-19, or corona. And also, additionally, the term nursing, uh, skill, uh, skill nursing facility could be referred to as SNS. A long-term care facility, LTC, or long-term care facility, skilled nursing home, and things like that. So we just need to get creative with those words and try to come up with a uh, phrase search, uh, trying to add all the synonyms and capture those words. And what my observation has been that rather than doing an and search of uh, COVID-19 and skilled nursing facility and uh, uh, testing, when we did this phrase search, trying to uh, find words within a number of uh, words tasting, we were able to get much better results which are much more accurate. So that is one thing that is definitely recommended instead of doing an and or uh, or search actually. Because an and or or search could go very, very, very vague. If there's an email with 1,000 pages, the first word could start at the starting of the body of the email and the last word could be somewhere in a content in an Excel document or it could be a Word document. So that record may not be relevant actually. So that is one thing, we can eliminate such things when we try to do a phrase search. And the third thing is that let's say if the end user is coming up with uh, keywords, it would always be better if they can prioritize which keyword takes precedence. So if they are giving us three keywords, I recommend them giving a priority, this is the first keyword that takes precedence, the second less precedence, and the third less, last precedence. Because when we run this records and we're getting too many records, when we run them to do it, it gives us a subset of records to us, or even in Office 365. That helps us uh, present the information to the analyst, stating that, okay, for this first keyword, you're seeing this records, and this is taking more precedence. If you want this to take precedence, we will give you this subset of records. So we are trying to help, I'm trying to help the user come up with what he's really looking for, rather than having keywords with an and and so forth. So that is one thing that really helps us, prioritizing the keywords, doing a phrase search, and giving the keywords to as minimal as possible. Any questions on the limiting the keywords? There are currently no questions in the front queue. This Raj, I wanted to I, I wanted to say something here because I, I want to make clear to everyone who's listening that there is no requirement that when you submit a FOIA request to us that you have to provide us with keywords. Um, so this example would be if you do provide us with keywords, limit the number of keywords because we've had we've had. Um, Two page. Sometimes folks give us a, a, a whole page of keywords or two pages of keywords. So, what is important? One of the most important things that you can do is to have a well-defined scope, right? If you have a well-defined scope, um, we will be able to to find, um, like the was saying, um, the keyword that you might use might not be the term that internally the folks who are having conversations would use. So, you might say long-term care. And maybe they just use a term, they, they might use the name of the facility or they might just say LCC or whatever it is. So if you if the, the scope is well defined, that's a very good start. If you want to provide keywords, you, you can uh, limit the number of keywords, but you don't, you don't, you're not required to give us keywords. You're also not required to give us custodians. But if you do want um, to give us a list of custodians, Limit the list of custodians because the more custodians you provide to us, the more records you're going to pull, the more duplicated records are going to be provided because if there are 10 or 15 custodians and all of them are CC'd or participants in a particular discussion, that means that one email string is going to be contained within 15 or 20 custodian email boxes. And so uh, just a point of clarification, you don't need to give us keywords. You don't need to give us a, a list of custodians, but if you do, just admit it. Thank you, Roger. It was a very useful information and a very good reminder. And I can move to the next uh, to, uh, item, which is avoiding generic keywords. So when I say generic keywords, right, I do see a lot of, I can give an example here. I see a lot of requests coming with autism. 
And uh, I had one request where uh, we were asked to search on a request on a custodian's mailbox, who is a researcher on autism. So when we did a search on his mailbox, all his emails were all about autism. So we came up with 30,000 records of autism-based emails within a span of three months. It was, it's like uh, trying to search a stockbroker's email with the word stock. So that was the type of uh, request which is very generic. In this instance, the recommendation would be to, if you are giving some generic keywords, please also provide some supplemental keywords that will help us narrow down the search. So if somebody is sending us autism and we are uh, searching the mailbox of an autism research, probably there is some medicine or there is a condition which is causing that. So some, something which can narrow down the search results or something which is more specific to that you are, or a subset of records within autism that you are looking for. So that really helps us out in the long run. And next is, uh, and it, as I said, and one more example is about the meat processing plant and guidelines and things like that. So even that that was very haywire where we had lots of keywords, very generic and things like that. So I'm just giving an example of if you give us generic keywords, also make sure that you do provide at least one supplemented keyword to narrow down the result. Uh, I can move to the next slide, uh, which is to limit the number of custodians. As uh, Roger has already gone over it, the more number of custodians that you're going to have, you're going to have more number of emails and more number of duplicates that you need to go through. So I'm hoping that I don't need to do that again and again. So the lesser number of custodians, we are going to get uh, the lesser number of records and it becomes a lot easier for us to like really uh, narrow down the search results. And the, la and the last item is, uh, reducing the time span of these searches, actually. So if uh, sometimes I do see requests coming with four years time span or five years time span, and uh, we find records, sometimes we don't find records because of the records retention policy, which is very different for each mailbox. Uh, however, we do notice that sometimes uh, when we run searches, like for a year or a couple of months, we get like 20,000, 30,000 records. So it's always better to like, uh, limit the time span, be very specific on which time span you're looking for. If there was an event that happened, probably a month around that event, 15 days before the event, 15 days after the event, probably makes sense where there's a lot of noise or heat maps related to this particular activity. Or let's say an example is that chlorothene. When, uh, when people talked about chlorothene, they just talked about for like a month or two. So if that one, one month or two, two months of time span can be identified, it really helps us to identify the right level of records actually. So these are some of these uh, improvements, actually, which will really help us get better search for you, the requesters, actually. And um, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm willing to answer them related to this uh, topic or this section. So, Srinath, this is Alina. Um, we have a question, actually, from our side. Uh, sure. From Oda, would you be able, and this is possibly a question also for Roger and Bruno, would you be able to, to talk a little bit about the role of the FOIA public liaison and whether uh, when a very broad search is submitted, is the requester able to reach out to the FOIA public liaison uh, who would be willing to help requesters draft a, a well-scoped request? Uh, yeah, sure, Alina. I mean, I'll, I'll leave the question to Roger. Roger, do you want to answer the question? Sure, uh, and then Veronica knows that. So, um, with CDC, yes, I've had requesters contact the FOIA public liaison, which is Eve, um, which I think now it's at Bruno's list at the FOIA public liaison, um, or they reach out to me. Uh, I'm more than happy to work with requesters to scope of the request. Um, but at least from where I sit, it is much more advantageous for them to work. What we do when we get it for a request is assigned to an analyst, and then analyst handles that case from cradle to grave, right? So at some point in the process, if it's COVID, I'm going to see that request, review the request, and then it gets released. Um, oftentimes, the person who knows the day-to-day, -day, the in and out, the SMEs, who has more details about the request would be the analyst. So. My preference would be to first start off working with an analyst. If there's an impasse, 
and then you have to escalate it, I'll be more than happy to jump in. Um, but I think if you start with an arm list, um, at most times, at most, I, I think in most situations, they are able to work with the requesters to reformulate their request in a way that is satisfactory to both sides. Uh, sometimes they, we have an impasse, and sometimes even if they might have an impasse with me, uh, it just depending upon what you're asking for. So, for example, if somebody says, I want you to do a search against all the email boxes by particular program or division, we're going to have an impasse because I'm going to say we can't search against three or 400 uh, custodians because Sirenet cannot push a button to do that. He's going to have to manually put in every single uh, email box for every single employee in that program division. That's, that, that, that right there would be an unreasonable uh, request, and it's going to take an unreasonable amount of time. So certainly, yes, you can contact the file public liaison. You can contact me directly. You can contact Bruno to help you reform the request. But the person you really should start with would be the person who's assigned to your request, and that person's name is always in your acknowledgement letter that you receive. So you have the contact information of that person in your acknowledgement letter, and it's best to start with that person. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. I think we have another question in the chat. Yes. Um, so it was explained earlier that containment tools pull the last email string. However, what happens if multiple strings are created with recipients and CCs added or dropped and conversations going in multiple directions? Will the programs keep those break-off strings, or will they be eliminated by the program? That's a uh, very good question, and I can take this question. I can, I can answer it for you. Yes, so if there is a breakage or somebody changes the content of the email or adds a new recipient or a uh, delete recipient, that chain is broken, and uh, it so happens that another record is created. But uh, when the analysts look at the record here, they make sure that sometimes if it is the same thing, it's not, it is missed as part of the containment, they can go ahead and delete the record if required. But it does break, if, if the chain is broken, it does create a new record, actually. So the containment will not work for that particular instance here. Yeah, just to amplify what Zinov said. So if, if, if all the email correspondence was not all contained within one email string, then any separate emails are complete separate records that are going to be pulled. They're not going to be eliminated. Okay, and then we had a sort of follow-up, I think, on the same basic topic. Could you please discuss the topic of the most comprehensive email thread? Uh, let me attempt to answer that question. I, I, I get, I, I'm going to assume when you say the most comprehensive email thread, you're saying that email thread that contains every single email correspondence about a particular topic. So if, 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 if that exists, because sometimes it may not exist, right? So if, if to the extent that an email thread contains every single discussion about that particular subject matter, well, I will assume that's the most comprehensive. And then to the extent that the, uh, the containment um, system identifies that, then it pulls that record. So that the requester is receiving every single permutation of discussion about that particular subject matter. But if they send that one email string is not comprehensive, then there are maybe multiple ones, sub, there are subsets of it would go in different directions, then those are going to have to be pulled. And then they're not going to be considered as dupes or near dupes, because they're not. So when you say they're going to be pulled, you mean they will be part of the responsive? Absolutely. Comprehensive part response of, yes, records. They will, Thank they, will you. Part, they will be part of the response. Exactly. And, part of and I want to add on to that as well. This is Bruno Viana at the CDC. Um, from my experience using the tool, and Sarnath Roger, you can back me up. As far as the duplicates and the containment is concerned, that tool is very sensitive. So I've had analysts come to me and say, these are duplicates. Why is it not catching it? But any sort of change here or there, if there's a, you know, if there's an attachment missing, if there's, if it's a forward, if there's, if there's any slight change, the tool is very sensitive and it'll include it in the responsive um, document set. So uh, let's, let's, let's give an example. For example, let's say uh, Roger Bruno and Alina had an email conversation about having this webinar, right? 
And so we had emails back and forth, and there's a, there's a final email thread of this discussion. And then I um, forward to um, Sirenes, and I just do FYI. I don't even say anything. I just forward to Sirenes the whole email string. Now that I've introduced Sirenes, that's a separate chain because he was not part of our conversation. I just forwarded the whole email string between myself, Bruno, and Alina to Sirenes. That is, we no longer have a quote unquote one comprehensive email. We've created two separate ones now. Uh, thank you, Roger, and uh, thank you, Bruno, for reminding us. And as uh, I'll just add one thing to what Bruno said is that if somebody even tries to uh, add a small line break within the email chain and uh, forward it to somebody else, it can create another uh, chain altogether. So we'll end up having the same content or the same scope, but as Roger has said, multiple uh, subsets of data now for the same from the same information. Thanks, everyone. I don't see anything else in chat right now. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would like to open this up to anybody within the user community who is willing to provide us any recommendations that can help us give, a, give them better results. So we can probably have a few minutes of chat or discussion to see if they have any suggestions for us. And we can take those suggestions and have them discussed internally within our CDC for your office. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to make a comment over the phone or you have a question, you may press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. I think you've done such a great job answering questions as we've gone along that uh, <laughs> everyone has been uh, have been uh, are silenced at this point, but um, we'll give everyone like a couple of minutes to absorb. And um, sure enough, I don't know if you want to ask Michelle to go to the next slide where your contact information is is there. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, I mean, yeah. Perfect. And, we did get um, one commendation on chat uh, that the information session was very helpful for understanding your end in order to work together. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Yes. yes. So if anybody has any additional questions, please feel to reach out to me related to any technical aspects. But if it is related to any business or administrative aspect, I recommend that you reach out to Roger or Bruno and they should be able to answer the question. And, uh, Martha, do we have any other questions on um, on the YouTube chat uh, platform? Nope, nothing from our colleagues who are watching the YouTube chat right now. Thank you. I just saw another chat question come in. Does the CDC have an analyst to do manual responsiveness checks to further reduce duplicate emails slash attachments within threats? Yeah. I will give this question to yeah. Roger Yeah, I'll take that one. Sure. So this is just the first part of pulling the records and deduping and doing all that. Every set of records that SRAF pulls is going to go to an analyst who is going to analyze it, you know, to go through the process of the records before it's released to the requester. During that process, if they are seeing duplicates, because it's not perfect. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's a computer. Whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Um, so you still need that human eye to look at it um, uh, to make sure that, you know, everything is still responsive or it's not, you know, we didn't pull a bunch out of scope stuff for one reason or the other. So, yes, there's every package that goes out, a, a person will still look at it and, and do that analysis, and they um, look for duplicates. And, again, as much as a, per, a computer is imperfect, we are too. So there may be duplicates that we miss, um, but we, you, you know, we go – we, we, we take all the effort in the world to make sure that we catch those, and not just for the requester, but it also, you know, it's, it's, it's easier on us if we can catch the duplicates. It's fewer pages that we've got to go line by line and review, so it helps us out as well. So we definitely do that, um, you know, review after certain ask process. It definitely goes through another review um, before the release. And this was, I wanted to add that in addition to the, the analyst who's assigned to review it, when I'm reviewing a COVID 
uh, records or Bloomer's review of COVID records, I'm also looking for everything. Uh, so to the extent that I see um, duplicate emails of the same that are contained within a comprehensive thread, if, if I could either say flag as a duplicate, or I might just leave it in. We have to make sure that the web process is consistently. That's that's the biggest thing I have to watch for is that that that, that separate email that is contained within a comprehensive email is not processed differently from the comprehensive one. Right. So I have to make sure that that is done accurately. Um, and so and as far as attachment goes, uh, that's a little bit more tricky when we talk about an attachment is um, a duplicate, right? Um, if if I send um, if I send if I have email if there's email correspondence between CDC officials and they attach a document, right? It says this is CDC's. Um, please review and edit um, CDC school guidance, for example. Let's just use that for example, right? And then that same school guidance edit is sent by, let's say, Dr. Walensky, and, and she sends it to, let's say, uh, the White House and says, this is our um, current draft of the EU the school guidance. I can't say that just because we have released it in this email string internally, it's the same thing, therefore it's, out. it's a duplicate. No, it's not. Right, because that email chain to EOP to White House is, is a separate email. That attachment is to that email string. Therefore, that the document itself is not a duplicate. So it's included, even though it's the exact same document that internally Walensky saw was given to by head, for, by head staff. It's the same document, but we're not going to mark that as a duplicate just because it's the same document attached to a different email. It's not. So when we come, when we talk about uh, um, re removing attachments as duplicates, it means that the email and the attachment are the same. So everything should be the same. Otherwise, it's in. So if the email string is the same, but the attachment is different, as a new record. If the email, if the if the the email string, yeah, if the email string is different, and there's a there's a um, the attachment is is the same we've seen earlier, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still a different record. And this, Roger, this is Bruno again. This goes back to the question that Roger answered at the beginning of the presentation. So in, in the FOIA world, it, it's considered the email and the associated attachments are considered a record. So that's why the default is if you make a request for emails, those attachments are going to come unless you say that you don't want them, you know, then we can exclude them. But in in in, in you know, a record in this instance is that email and any associated attachments. So that's why even though the body of the email is just a forward or it's just, you know, it looks the same or the body of the, um, I'm sorry, the attachment is the same. There's no changes made to an attachment, but Roger sends me a draft of, uh, you know, a document to five different people. It's going to go to five different people. The attachment's the same, but the text may be different, you know, if it's forwarded or replied, but there's no changes to that uh, attachment. Martha, I think we have another couple of chat questions. Yes. Um, so this is getting to communication between the analyst and the requester. Will the analyst reach out and say, your request is probably high intensity. Can we talk about scope to get it to moderate or low? Or will you do the search first before you determine that it's high intensity? I guess the question is when a request comes in, you know, can a, is there always a search conducted or can it, be determined to be high intensity before the search is conducted? I think this, that's the question. Quite, yeah, this is Roger. I think, uh, at least from my experience, some requests on its face will be a high intensity search without you having to do a search. Uh, but in some s situations, um, I've asked my staff to go, before you go back and say this is overly broad or vague or voluminous, we need to have data to support that, right? So we should do a preliminary search and see what we pull because it might turn out that there's not much discussion here. And sometimes we might do the search and realize, oh, okay, there wasn't a lot of conversations around the subject matter. It, it seemed broad on its face, but there wasn't much conversation here. So, um, but to the extent that, so if we do the search and then we determine it's a high intensity search, then CNS would make that known to the analyst and the analyst would go back to the requester with enough information to help them to from the request. But sometimes on its face, uh, and I go back to this one about 
I want all correspondence that the CDC had um, with, for example, the White House. Okay. <laughs> um, any conversation that CDC had with the White House from January 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2020 on its face is going to be a high intensity search uh, because they're going to be multiple people, they're going to be multiple email domain names. That's going to be high intensity search right on its face, and we don't need to, need to do a search to tell us that. So it, it depends, is the answer. Right. Which yes, is fair. It depends. Yes, exactly. Right. It depends. <laughs> Um, one question that someone had regarding duplicates, um, if the recipient changes but the email thread is identical, um, the thread containing a different recipient would be contained as a non-duplicate, is that correct? That, that's so correct. The content is exactly the same, but you've got a different it's recipient. It's, it's, a, it's a different it's email. A, it's a different email, yes. Okay. I don't see anything else in the chat right now unless I've missed something, Lena. No, I don't see anything else either. I think we've asked all the questions. Michelle, anyone wants to chime in orally on the phone? Uh, no, I do not see any um, chat questions or comments on the phone. Okay. All right, Charles, any other wrap-up words before we say goodbye to everyone and let them get on with their day? Yeah, sure, uh, Lina. I'd like to wrap this up by saying that uh, we would like to avoid the situation of the needle in the haystack as long as uh, the scope is finalized and the scope is very concise. I think the biggest takeaway from this session would be that if the requester can provide us the right scope, it makes their life and our life a lot easier. And uh, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to present at uh, today's session, and uh, I thank uh, our partners at OGIS for uh, giving this opportunity for me to present this information and hopefully this is a helpful uh, session uh, and it helps us to, to even cut down on our search results. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Roger and Bruno, any other parting thoughts before we uh, say goodbye to our folks? Bruno, you want to go first? Sure, I will. Um, I just want to say thank you again to OGIS and I would recommend any other uh, FOIA offices, um, you know, reach out and use their services as well. They're very, they're great about advertising events and organizing, running them, moderating, you know, doing all the work. So they make us look good. We we do the easy part. So um, we really appreciate that. Yeah, I also okay. echo. I also would echo that, and I'll encourage uh, any federal agency that's uh, listening in um, to take advantage of uh, of uh, taking a, uh, take advantage of. Uh, uh, the opportunity that OGC has given to us to to communicate with their requesters um, about their FOIA requests. I think the more we can communicate and the more we can let requesters know the challenges that we have to go through, what we have to do, I think the better it is for all of us. And I want to say, at least on behalf of CDC, uh, FOIA office and, and, and the agency, is that we take our job in responding to FOIA requests very seriously, and we work tirelessly. Uh, I have to say that we work tirelessly every day um, to make sure that we get um, response time to for requests. Are we perfect? No. Are we close to being perfect? No. But we try hardest every day to to get there. And this is part of what we're trying to do is to is to hopefully get for requests to understand that they can help us make that goal of getting responses to them as timely as we can. Thank you. Great message, Roger, during Public Service Recognition Week. So <laughs> I think, yes, we're all tireless uh, government employees. Well, thank you all very much today, Chernas, Roger, and Bruno. Um, you've all done a great job of covering a lot of important material. Um, I think everyone will find it very helpful. They have your contact information if they have any follow-up questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. Uh, take care, everyone, and have a great day. Thank Bye. You. Thank you all. Bye-bye. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.